like herding cats. So can you hear me? They, they're, not, they're not able to hear me? No. Uh, what? <laughs> that's, that's my children's excuse. I didn't hear you say that. How about now? Am I coming through the sound now? Yes. Okay, very good. Very good. Okay. Well, today we've got several. Oh, we just lost it. Okay. We're not going to have them up. It just shut itself down. Oh, that's weird. It's, it's Check, uh, just... You know when, when they say that Satan is in the details? He's in technology. It's wonderful when it works properly. It's going to be a minute. When it doesn't. It'll take just a little bit to get going here. Back to the ranch. It's coming. You guys are all fine. The church is upside down. Okay. Click on this one. I have five on that. Perfect. You may have to. There we go. Just click it. I hate it when software updates happen. It messes the whole system up. Okay, bring that back over to the to the monitor there. It lost its <laughs> setting as having separate screens. Yeah, well, just bring it back over to the monitor and then you can do it that way. Try it that again. Slide that one over to the monitor also. There you go. Now open up the first one. Okay. Yeah, now you see it. Now. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's putting it up on the, okay. on the computer. Okay, right. well, we're going to do it the old fashioned way. Okay. Well, the first thing we're going to talk about is Acts 2.42 groups. For some of you saying, what's Acts 2.42 groups? That's what at Acts 2.42 and you can see what we do. We eat, or we drink some refreshments, uh, we fellowship together, we pray together, and we study God's Word together. And basically what that is, uh, as far as studying God's Word is, you just get to talk about out. the message so we can that we're going to be doing this morning. See, he's all excited about this. <laughs> So, we're going to be talking about the message and some questions that are designed for all of us to relate together on that. That will be at Ron and Sally Hughes' house. Ron and Sally, everybody knows Ron and Sally. Okay? You know where they live. So, the other one is at Melinda Bushard's house. And for those of you that don't know where Melinda lives, uh, you know where the stove shop is on the highway right outside of Newport? Okay, the very next road this way uh, is right next to there. You turn that way. And you, then there's a driveway that angles off. You'll probably see our vehicle there. Okay? That's what road? Route 2. Gray Road. It is the Gray Road. Off of Route 2. Thank you. There are street signs. Wow. When you see the dead cow, turn right. It's not quite that bad. So you can choose whichever group you want to go to. Uh, if you have questions, just check with me or check with Ron and we'll, we'll let you know or check with Belinda as well. The ladies retreat to Camp Maria, those of you that are going, you'll be leaving about 10-ish or so, is that correct? They are still, they know what they're doing. Pray for the men and the families left behind uh, that they will be able to survive. Pastor Corey, this Friday, movie day, share as you wish. We are going to watch the Princess Bride. Okay. So if you would like to bring some snacks for yourself or to share and bring your friends and someone to bring them. Inconceivable. That's awesome. That's going to be a good time. A good time there. Okay. Uh, at this time, we are going to ask uh, Bill Stanley if he would come forward, please. Bill, would you come up front here, please? Bill Stanley has uh, shared with the elders his testimony. Bill has been coming here for some time now, and Bill has come to the point in his life where he says, I want to make this my church family, and I'm going to let everyone know this is my church family, because I want to become a member of this church. So, I didn't warn you about this, but I've got some questions. We're going to see if you study. <laughs> no fear. Bill, having come to know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, 
and having been baptized upon profession of your faith, are you committed to pursuing maturity in Christ? Yes. All right. Do you accept the Bible as the Word of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and as your final authority in all matters of faith and conduct? He knows. <laughs> He's all committed here. So now, do you commit yourself to this local body in different ways? To uphold with your prayers, to uphold with your finances, and your gifts and talents that God has given to you? Yes. Wonderful. So, uh, we're going to, at, at our time of greeting, we're going to have Bill up here. And so, Bill, I'm going to ask uh, what is time for... Actually, no, we'll just have you back in the back. Is that where you'd like to be, back in the back? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's where it's going to be. And Bill and a couple of the elders will be in the back there during our greeting time. I want you to extend to him the right hand of fellowship. Okay? And I'm going to do that right now. Welcome to our membership, my brother. He thought this was going to be a walk in the park. Are we on? How about this one? Not? Okay. That's okay. There. The worship team will very much appreciate that. Okay, I'm going to ask all of you to arise if you will, please. This is primarily for the members of this church family. However, all of you, I would challenge and encourage you to read along with us and make us part of your commitment as well. It's, a, it's our church covenant, and uh, it's always good to be reminded of this. The elders talk to me every night and say, you know, we need to be reminded of what we have promised before each other and especially before the Lord. So let's read along together. Having been led by the Spirit of God to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior and on the possession of our faith, having been baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we do in the presence of God, angels, and this assembly most solemnly and joyfully enter into covenant with one another as one body in Christ. We purpose as those redeemed unto God by the precious blood of Christ to live in a manner befitting the high calling of God in Jesus Christ by being obedient to the word and diligently seeking to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Number two. We purpose to abstain from sinful desires, no longer conforming any longer to the pattern of this world, and to offer ourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of our body to Him as instruments of righteousness. We pursue to love one another, which must be sincere, to help one another when needful, and to pray for all saints, we shall strive by all means to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace, refraining from all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. We purpose to support this church faithfully in all its ministries, attending its services, diligently exercising our individual gifts of the Spirit on Christ's behalf and contributing both bountifully and cheerfully to its expenses and ministries as the Lord has prospered us. We purpose that we shall contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints, speaking the truth in love, the essentials of the Christian faith we believe to be embodied in our statement of faith and practice, and we shall therefore strive to defend and spread these truths, both vigorously and graciously. Did you guys know that you committed to all those things? <laughs> and by the way, our statement of faith and practice is simply a reworking of the scriptures in language which is able to be shared with others. It's not anybody's ideas, it's not our personal opinions, it's what the Bible teaches. And everyone who joins this church as a member has the opportunity to go through that. We discuss that, and anybody is free to look at that and discuss it at any point in time. So at this point in time, we are going to have a word of prayer, committing ourselves, and Bill in particular, into being obedient to these covenant affirmations. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much that we can be part of a local church body, serving you, impacting the community for
for Jesus Christ, encouraging one another and also holding each other accountable. Father, we thank you that Jesus Christ is the head of this church. It's not me, it's not any other person, it's Jesus alone. And we give you all the glory for, first of all, our salvation. Because without that, we would be a people of no hope, and this building would be meaningless to us. This group would have no understanding. But because of Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit in us. We have that hope of eternal life forever in your presence. And Father, right now I pray that you will help each one of us to stay true to these commitments that we have made. And that we will do so not in a legalistic fashion, but we will do so because of the great love that you've given to us, which causes us to love you. Father, we thank you for your incredible love and for the opportunity now to sing praise to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you for being with us this morning. And just going to wait a second as Renee now makes his way back around and over to the drum set. Not bringing any attention to what he's doing. Hopefully he won't trip and fall on the cymbals or anything like that. So thank you for being with us here this morning. And our desire, I pray that our desire is to lift our voices together singing his praise to him. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name.
that in Christ alone, my hope is found. Praise the name.
nothing, that nothing will separate me from your love, Lord, when I come to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Father, you are there as my protector. You are here now as my healer. You are here now, Lord, to guide and direct my, to direct my path. Lord, you are here with us now. Help us to turn to you each and every day, recognizing your love for us, Lord. May we in turn be committed to love you. Lord, I thank you and praise you that for every, every day that I spend here until your return, Lord, that you provide blessing upon blessing upon blessing. Lord, as we bring our tithe and offering, help us to do so cheerfully, gladly. Lord, giving back, which is really yours, Father. I thank you for the opportunity to give in a way that is powerful. Even from the smallest amount, there is power in it, Lord. Help us to believe that you will use these things in a mighty way. Help us to be wise, Lord. Give us the ability to know the direction to use this so that it can be used fully for your kingdom and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I Lift My Hands is a wonderful song by Chris Tomlin. This is a wonderful verse from God's Word. Let us search and try our ways and turn again to the Lord. Let us lift up our hearts with our hands to God in the heavens. And as, as we sing this song, there's a phrase that comes in, let faith arise, let faith arise, and open our eyes. And this idea of, I lift my hands to believe again. It isn't that I forgot so much, it's more that I need a reminder.
faith to increase and to grow, that we might become more like Jesus day by day. Father, we do indeed lift our hands to you. Just like a child to the parent, we not only need you, but we love you. And we need your help and your guidance day by day so that we can live a life which is pleasing to you, a life which will impact others for the kingdom of God. We pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Children, come on up for children to
sometimes starts over. Does anybody find that cycle part of their lives? Most of us do. If you're breathing, <laughs> you probably experience that cycle. And you're not alone. Okay, I want to encourage you. You're not alone. I'm not encourage you to keep going through the cycle. But just know that you're not alone. The danger that I see is for some individuals that cycle can sometimes get short-circuited. And it ends up being a downward spiral. Because we've forgotten our source of power. And you don't want that to happen. So this morning I want us to just focus on this as our theme. That you and I need to have a continual desire for revival in our lives. This is our theme as you'll see on the screen here shortly. We need to have a continual desire for revival in our lives. Okay? Even if you're in right relationship with God, you still want to have that desire. Because what's the danger? This temptation to go back again. Now we're going to see that for revival to happen, there's often a need for corrections in our lives. You know, we live in a culture, uh, I, I just have to laugh at the pharmaceutical industry. They, they have these commercials on TV, and if you're experiencing this, take this pill. It could cause death. <laughs> and, and seriously, one of them says that. Well, at least one of them says that. Or it could cause all these other factors. I'm saying, wow, we To cure this one issue, which really isn't that big an issue, we're going to take this pill to make it all better. But the possibility is you could die or have other major problems. You deserve a break today, Pat. <laughs> Have it your way. <laughs> but why do we have fast food, James? We want it right now. We want it right now. We, we want the instantaneous gratification. Even with our technology, they're sweating bullets up there, and I'm going. It's all prepared. It should be. Well, I want it right now, right? That's how we do spiritually too, don't we? If there's issues in our lives, we think we're going to deal with it right now, and it's going to, no pain, it's going to just be solved. Well, sometimes in revival, there's a little pain, isn't there? We're going to look at Nehemiah chapter 13, by the way. I believe this will be the last sermon on Nehemiah from here this year. Okay? Nehemiah 13, the first three verses we have corrections from God's Word. You see, the only way for a Christian to truly know how to live for Christ is to spend time in the Bible on a regular basis, preferably a daily basis at least. Okay? It's the only way you're going to know how to live your life for Jesus. Interestingly, in these first three verses, we see that God's Word is what reminds the people to correct that which is not right. Follow along. On that day, they read aloud from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people. And there was found written in it that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God because they did not meet the sons of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. However, our God turned the curse into a blessing. So when they, the Israelites right now, or right then, heard the law, they excluded all foreigners from Israel. Now Nehemiah has gone back to being with the king, doing his duties in the court, as it were, whatever his responsibility was. But he, at this point, is coming back to meet with the people in Israel. Sadly, he found out that God's people had gone back to their old ways. Surprise, surprise. They did it again. What a reminder. If you look at these verses. When they had heard, or when they had read this, then they made a change. You see, when you and I aren't in God's Word on a regular basis, we don't know. We forget. How convenient. I remember I was a great algebra student. You know, I used the word was. I had straight A's. In fact, I had over 100% because our algebra teacher 
had a thing with my best friend that I because we were competing to be at the top of the class where he give us extra credit. <coughs> yes, I was a nerd. So we, we worked on this. Now the children, as they're working on algebra, I'm going, <laughs> you don't use it, you, you lose it. I lost it. With God's word, you're not in it, you forget it. Wow, that was almost poetic. I scared myself. Sorry. And that wasn't even in my notes, by the way. I should stick to my notes, shouldn't I? <laughs> so we have to be in God's Word regularly. We have to be in continual prayer with Him. And we need to be in fellowship with other brothers and sisters in Christ. If we're not, our tendency, our propensity is to go back to the old ways. And that's the danger. These verses here are a reminder of the danger of not obeying God's Word completely. See, back in Deuteronomy and back in Numbers, the Jews were told that having the Ammonites and the Moabites there was unacceptable. And because of the sin which took place earlier, generations later were going to continue to suffer. Now, folks, understand this is not just a blanket statement against all Ammonites and all Moabites. How do we know that? Remember the book of Ruth. Remember Ezra 6. You see, any foreigner could become part of the Jewish community. How? Accept God. Choose to follow God. Follow God's ways. Okay? Then you can become part of the community. Now here at our church, anyone's welcome to attend, right? Anyone's welcome to attend. Unless, oh, pastor's going to start laying out some rules. No, the Bible does. Unless the person's here to destroy or to disrupt. Okay, then they're not welcome. <coughs> the ushers have been trained on how to remove them. They're going to call on you. <laughs> I thought I'd send that out there. Now, if there is repentance, and if there's a turning to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you know what? Even they are welcome to fully participate in our worship. Because they're going to want to. But someone that comes in here to try to destroy God's people or God's church, we won't permit it. But will we allow homosexual to come in and worship with us? You bet we will. They won't understand who they're worshiping until they come to Jesus Christ. Will we let a gossip come in here and worship? Some of you say, yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Can I say that out loud? <laughs> will we let a murderer come in here? Yeah. Absolutely. But not to have a say in how worship is done or how we do church or anything like that. You see, if they don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they're welcome to come and to hear God's Word spoken and His Word sung. And we need to remember that. We also see in verses 4 through 9, as we have gone into the Word, there are some corrections that need to be done. Corrections for God's house. Verses 4 through 9. It appears here from verse 6 that when the main leader Nehemiah had been gone, some of the spiritual leadership, Eliashib in particular, had gone back to some of the old ways of being disobedient to God. Let's look at the verses. It says, Now prior to this, Eliashib the priest, who was appointed over the chambers of the house of our God, being related <clears throat> to Tobiah, had prepared a large room for him. Where formerly they put the grain offering, the frankincense, the utensils, and the tithes of grain, wine, and oil prescribed for the Levites, the singers, and the gatekeepers, and the contributions for the priests. But during all this time, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes of Babylon, I am gone to the king. In other words, this was done not when Nehemiah was there, but when he was gone. When the cat's away. After some time, however, I asked leave from the king, and I came to Jerusalem and learned about the evil that Elisha had done for Tobiah by preparing a room for him in the courts of the house of God. It was very displeasing to me, so I called the committee to, you know, I threw all of Tobiah's household goods out of the room. Then I gave an order, and they cleansed the rooms. And I returned there the utensils of the house of God with the grain offerings and the frankincense. It appears here that as you look at these verses, that the high priest was not just allied with Tobiah, who by the way was an enemy of the Jews, but he gave him a place to live in the temple. He even 
even took that which rightfully belonged to the priests and Levites, and he gave it to Tobiah. Now, why do I say Tobiah was naming? Remember, several weeks ago, probably months ago, we looked at this, and Tobiah had been married to a Jew. He was married to a Jew, but he was one of the main ringleaders who openly, blatantly opposed Nehemiah in the rebuilding of the city. Not a nice guy. You oppose Nehemiah, you're opposing God. Basically, the priest had put the fox into the chicken house. You all know that saying, don't you? If not, you just heard it. Think about the mental picture. Tobiah found himself in a very influential position in the Jewish community. He's in the temple. In fact, it's so bad that Nehemiah says in verse 7, this act is the evil that Elijah had done for Tobiah. Not only had this been allowed, there's intentionality about it. <clears throat> I can do what I want to do. I'm going to get this guy in this position of influence and leadership. So as soon as Nehemiah found out about it, he threw Tobiah and all this stuff out, cleansed that area for its intended use for God's glory. Okay, that was back then. What about today? What about us? Folks, a principle that we need to understand is you and I cannot become allied with people who are enemies of God. It doesn't matter how much we want to be liked. It doesn't matter how much we want to be perceived as loving. If they are fighting against God, if they're being intentional about disobeying God to be disruptive to the body of Christ, trying to destroy God's people or to poison His people, we don't join forces with them. We don't join forces with them. Now please understand, I'm not referring to individuals who are simply blinded by the God of this age. Okay? Please have friendships with them. How are they going to see Jesus? Okay? You have to have that. Because you and I know, what were we at one time? Enemies of God. Every one of us was. And thank Lord that somebody befriended us. That someone who loved Jesus came alongside us and pointed us to the Savior. But I am talking about people who may have heard the good news, who have rejected it, and they're promoting that which is sin and is in opposition to God and His people. You don't join forces with them. You and I need to respond to evil when it begins to infiltrate Christ's church. Peacemaking is a good thing, however compromise with evil is always a bad thing. Verses 10 through 14, we see corrections for giving. Well, that, that was law. Now we have corrections for giving. He says, I also discovered that the portions of the Levites had not been given them, so that the Levites and the singers who performed the service had gone away, each to his own field. So I reprimanded the officials and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? Then I gathered them together and restored them to their posts. All Judah then brought the tithe of the grain, wine, and oil into the storehouses. In charge of the storehouses, I appointed Shelemiah the priest, Zadok the scribe, and Bediah the Levites. In addition to them was Hanan the son of Zachar, the son of Mataniah. Why? For they were considered reliable, and it was their task to distribute to their kinsmen. Remember me for this, O oh my God, and do not blot out my loyal deeds, which I have performed for the house of my God and its services. As I look at this, I'm reminded that when you and I are in God's word, when we're in communion with Him, He's going to point out sin in our lives, isn't He? He's going to point out areas where we're disobedient to Him. And He will help us to become obedient to Him. He will help us to become more like Jesus. What's the problem here? The people had stopped supporting the spiritual leadership. And Nehemiah didn't mince words. The focus wasn't just on the people. The focus was on God's servants, God's house. You forsaken God by not being obedient to His word. Now, understand the Levite's support came from a tithe that the people were supposed to be bringing. In fact, if you go back to Nehemiah 9 and 10, the people had promised to do this. In the last part of chapter 10, it says, we will not neglect the house of our God. They had made this promise before everyone. And here, just three chapters, but, well, three chapters, some time span later, but it was, it was later on, something happened. Because they're no longer keeping their promise. They were not being obedient to God's commands. 
And it was at this point that Nehemiah made some very practical and dependable changes to make sure that this doesn't happen again. Even in this very pragmatic, practical area here, Nehemiah is seen asking for God's help. Because it's ministry. You see, everything you and I do is for God's glory, is it not? It doesn't have to be just preaching or teaching. That's not just ministry. It doesn't have to be just singing. That's not just ministry. You can make carpet for the glory of God. You can teach for the glory of God. You can build houses for the glory of God. That's all ministry. It's different kinds of ministry. Please understand that. It's interesting also to observe that when you and I become lax in spiritual purity, just like them, what happens? We begin to develop a careless, reckless attitude in our spiritual lives. We begin to make comments to ourselves, what's the big deal if I miss Bible reading today? Oh God, here's my thoughts anyway. He knows everything anyway. Why should I pray? God knows I love Him. Why should I be singing praise to Him? I can't sing. Well, God knows that I'm glad to be part of His family, but why do I need to attend church? We become very lax. And here we see, and we see it even in North America today, when our spiritual lives begin to go south, giving towards God's work becomes less. When offerings start dropping, I don't think so much about economics and finances. I think about the spiritual welfare of our church family. Does that make sense? Because if you and I stop giving biblically, stop giving in obedience as God leads us, our spiritual life needs to be revived. It's important that we also have people serving who are considered trustworthy. That's why the elders are so very <coughs> cautious, making sure that we are not lax in having people of integrity in positions of leadership. Do we ever make mistakes? Are we human? <laughs> sometimes we aren't hearing God clearly. Sometimes <coughs> we aren't listening. <coughs> That's why we need you to pray for the elders. We also see an interesting thing here. In verses 15 through 22, we see corrections for God's day. In those days, I saw in Judah, verse 15, some who were treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sacks of grain and loading them on donkeys as well as wine, grapes, figs, and all kinds of loads, and they brought them into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. So I admonished them on the day they sold food. Also, men of Tyre were living there who imported fish and all kinds of merchandise and sold them to the sons of Judah on the Sabbath, even in Jerusalem. Then I reprimanded the nobles of Judah and said to them, What is this evil thing you are doing by profaning the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers do the same, so that our God brought on us and on the city all this trouble? Yet you're adding to the wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. So it came about that just as it grew dark at the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I commanded that the doors should be shut and that they should not open them until after the Sabbath. Talk about a major league timeout. Mm -hmm. Then I stationed some of my servants at the gates so that no load would enter on the Sabbath day. Once or twice, the traders and merchants of every kind of merchandise spent the night outside Jerusalem. Then I warned them and said to them, Why do you spend the night in front of the wall? If you do so again, I will use force against you. From that time on, they did not come on the Sabbath. I wonder what Nehemiah looked like. And I commanded the Levites that they should purify themselves and come as gatekeepers to sanctify the Sabbath day. For this also remember me, O oh my God, and have compassion on me according to the greatness of your loving kindness. In this section we see that they were forgetting one of the fundamental and unique ways of how they were identified as God's chosen people. They were in violation of the Sabbath commandments. Now in verse 15, you see that there were workers who were laboring on the Sabbath. In verse 16, you see business owners who are selling and profiting on the Sabbath. So there's no indication here that they were setting the Sabbath aside for God's glory as His people. In fact, 
the prophets, as you look back through the different prophets, they often reminded the people that if they became careless about observing the Sabbath, then they're also going to become careless about what God wants of them in other areas of their lives as well. Isn't that interesting? Slack in one area spreads to other areas. So Nehemiah's solution, he reprimanded them and closed the gates of the city on anyone who wanted to do business on the Sabbath, even though this was becoming the new norm, Nehemiah was unwilling to compromise and say, well, that's the sign of the times. He was unwilling to say, well, everybody else is doing it. We've got to keep up with everybody else. He said, no, God said, don't, we shall not. We want to be obedient to God, even if the majority is willing to be disobedient. Now, you're saying, okay, we, we're not under the Sabbath here. What's, what's the significance to us today? You're right. Ever since the early church began, we've no longer been under the Sabbath. That's no longer the focus. However, the early church met on the Lord's Day, which was Sunday. And it seems to me that the principles found in the Old Testament ought to be applicable to the New Testament and to the age of the church as well, if that's the case. Maybe we should use Sunday to glorify God and not pursue our own agendas. Ever think about that one? I understand that sometimes work must be done on Sunday. Growing up on the farm, it's always chores. You don't tell the cattle and the hogs, sorry, no milking, no feed today, it's Sunday. Okay? You don't do that. You have to do the basic things that have to be done. All right? Also, the Old Testament says that if the ox is in the ditch on the Sabbath, you get him out of the ditch. My father used to use that one a lot. <laughs> Grandpa's response was, that's all fine and good, but just make sure you didn't push him in the ditch the night before. <laughs> Sometimes we do push him in the ditch, don't we? We conveniently do things on Sunday that we ought not to be doing. You know, if you and I, a principle that we live by, if you and I can avoid doing work that we normally do the rest of the week, then let's not do it on Sunday. Let's not do it on Sunday. Well, what do we do, Pastor? I mean, we're, we're in church from 9 o'clock. <clears throat> Sunday school's at 9 o'clock, by the way. <laughs> Where's Angel? She appreciates that. <laughs> 9 o'clock till noon. I mean, what more can you expect of us? Well, don't you think we'd bring greater glory and honor to God if we use Sundays to honor Him, whether it be in corporate worship or in visiting? How many of you don't like to visit with people? Anybody? You know, if not, we'll just single you out and say, don't go visit with people. <laughs> Most of us like visiting, don't we? We like it when people come over and say, hey, how you doing? Or come over and visit with me for a little bit. Just encouraging other people in the name of Christ. Now, don't get into this issue of being legalistic about it. Been there, done that. Don't become a legalist about it. But as I look at Jesus' life and his example, I believe there's some principles we can apply. And Mervyn Brenneman suggests, and I worded this so wonderfully I had to quote it here, it seems that all that Jesus did on the Sabbath showed that he was not concerned with, quote, how not to desecrate the Sabbath. It seemed that he was more concerned about, quote, how to sanctify the Lord's day. So rather than looking at what can we do to not mess up the Lord's day, look at what can we do to bring glory and honor to God on this Lord's day. And as you look at Jesus' ministry, isn't that what he did? When he healed, when he fed on the Sabbath, it was to bring glory and honor to God every time. There's a large business that still keeps its door shut on Sunday. You know what that business name is? It's moving to Bangor. Opening a store in Bangor. It's called Hobby Lobby. You ladies will enjoy that. It, it, uh, it's even greater than A.C. Moore. The owner of Hobby Lobby is a Christian man. By the way, Hobby Lobby, the owner of Hobby Lobby, he's the one that underwrites version on your electronic devices. The Bible, version. Now, on all of their stores throughout the United States, there's a sign. This store is shut or closed on Sundays so that our employees may spend time with their families worshiping. 
Some of you may be asking, praise God for that. Some of you may be thinking, yeah, but look at all the money they're losing. You know what? They're one of the most powerful, wealthy corporations in North America. Why do you think Obamacare is fighting so hard against them? And by the way, they won the victory on that one unless it gets thrown into court again. Because they do not want to support that which goes against biblical principles. Folks, can you survive without working on Sundays? I think you can. And, I, and I'm an old farmer. Well, I used to be a farmer. I'm not old. Okay? But I recall very clearly that whenever there was intentionality about working on Sunday, we broke down once during the week. And it wasn't just a breakdown, it was a major league breakdown. But when we gave Sunday to God, and Grandpa's philosophy was, if God gave it, he'll keep it. And if it gets hailed out Sunday afternoon, we weren't supposed to have it. People say, well, that's kind of ignorant. I don't think so. I think God honors that. Sometimes I fear that Christians in North America are more concerned about economic stability than they are in trusting God and what He wants to do in their lives. Well, this last part I'd really like to avoid, verses 23 through 31, but you know me, I'm not. We're going to have corrections for godly marriages here, for the purpose of godly marriages. He says, In those days I also saw that the Jews had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Young people, please listen carefully because this probably <coughs> pertains to you more than anybody else. Not that it doesn't pertain to us, but especially young people. As for their children, half spoke in the by the way, the young people over here too. Half spoke in the language of Ashdod, and none of them was able to speak the language of Judah, but the language of his own people. So I contended with them and cursed them and struck some of them and pulled out their hair. I like this guy. <laughs> and made them swear by God, you shall not give your daughters to their sons, nor take of their daughters for your sons or for yourselves. Did not Solomon, now listen to this. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin regarding these things? Yet among the many nations, there was no king like him, and he was loved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, the foreign women caused even him to sin. Do we then hear about you that you have committed all this great evil by acting unfaithfully against our God by marrying foreign women? Even... The son, one of the sons of Joiada, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, by the way, are you surprised there, was a son-in-law of Sambaloth, the Horonite, so I drove him away from me. Remember them, O oh my God, because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood of the Levites. Thus, I purified them from everything foreign and appointed duties for the priests and the Levites, each in his task, and I arranged for the supply of wood at appointed times and for the first fruits. Remember me, O oh my God, for good. Already, Nehemiah and Ezra have already acted to stop the mixed marriages. The problem comes back. It keeps coming back. I hear, even in churches, there's no godly young men, there's no godly young women, they're all jerks and twits. Okay? Well, the last part I probably said. <laughs> Now, if I look at the methodology that Nehemiah used, elders, can we incorporate this as a pattern for him? No, I'm sorry. I, I can't, I, I'm not going to suggest that we do this. You know, we curse them, we pull their hair out, we, you know. You just got to get the impression, Nehemiah was really upset. And he had every reason to be upset because they just had revival. We need it again? Don't you guys get it? The problem was so many people were apathetic about their relationship with God. Young people, if you are in love with Jesus Christ, listen carefully. If you are in love with Jesus Christ, please do not listen to the ways of the world. Tell your hormones to shut up. And do it God's way. Follow His way. Don't go settling for anything other than a godly man or a godly woman who God has chosen for you. You recall the movie Fireproof? Most all of us have seen that movie, right? In that movie, the husband had become so numb 
to what his sin was doing that he didn't see the tragedy unfolding before him as he was losing his wife. And when he finally realized the incredible depth of his sin and his disobedience to God, he took major action. Do you remember what it was? He smashed that computer to smithereens. Baseball. Baseball bat city. You're telling me he was not going to allow anything to cause him to thwart his relationship with God. And this was the issue, even though it was a hard issue, this was the means of which it was happening, and he took, and, and I'm like, oh my goodness, that's $1,200. <laughs> $1,200 is nothing compared to God's love. Your relationship with Him and with your spouse is everything. Now that, my friends, is priceless. Drastic? Yep. Same type of drastic behavior Nehemiah took, isn't it? And it's that same type of drastic behavior that you and I need to make happen in our lives to make sure that sin doesn't set up camp in our lives. To make sure that we don't become immune to sin. To make sure that we do not forget our Lord and what He tells us to do. Folks, for some of us that means telling friend A or friend B, uh -uh, you're out of my life until you get right with Jesus because you're taking me down into the quicksand. For some of you, that means shutting off cable and shutting off satellite. Or internet. For some of you, that means I'm not going to this place ever again because it drags me down. It drags me away from Jesus. You take the drastic behavior necessary because you want revival. Mm -hmm. You want the richness and fullness that Jesus Christ has promised. If we just seek Him. Now, let me just help out here on something. What Nehemiah is talking about, he's not talking about intermarriage between different races or nationalities. Okay? We know throughout Scripture that has happened. That's okay. If one's a Christian, I don't care if you're purple or orange, you can get married. <laughs> if you both love Jesus. But what the Bible forbids, and folks, I can't stress this enough, it's not just a suggestion, it's not just a nicety, it forbids marrying an unbeliever. What are we doing to our young people when we say, oh, you're so in love, you're so cute together, you're so wonderful together, one of you is going to hell, but one of you is going to heaven, how wonderful. Think about that, the last sentence you didn't say, but you should have said it. You should have said it. One of the worst issues I find is that children who are born into that type of a mixed marriage are not brought up in a situation where faith in Jesus Christ is encouraged. And maybe one of them tries, but it is an uphill battle every step of the way. What can we learn from this? Even as I look into this in the context of the whole, I'm reminded of a couple of things. One is that you and I need to do whatever it is we must do to restore things to the way that God wants them. I remember part of the Jesus movement. Having a bonfire. Yes, with eight track tapes. Okay? And albums. You know what the albums are? It's giant CDs. <laughs> What did we have a bonfire for all that for? Because of a lot of the music we were listening to was just evil. A lot of the music we were listening to was not at all honoring to God. It was not glorifying at all to God. And young people, I dare say there's a lot of music that's out there right now. You listen to the lyrics, you look up the lyrics if you can't understand the lyrics, and you read what's said, and it is just evil. It is just evil. Miley Cyrus, are you kidding me? She's trying to make acceptable behavior that ought not ever to be. But it's not just Miley Cyrus. The other individual, what's his name? Thick. Ought to have a boot aimed his way also. Because he allowed it to happen. As the gentleman, as the man, he should have said, this is unacceptable, we're not doing this. And I don't care if it's live on Lord's night, we're not going there. 
But if you don't know Jesus, why would you say that? But you and I who know Jesus, why are we just as quiet as my and faith? The other thing is that even though we may have to take action, we need to bring it before God always. I see Him constantly. Oh Lord, remember me in this. Remember these things, O oh God. God alone is the one who can change hearts. Isn't that right? It doesn't matter how much hair we pull out. It doesn't how much we curse at the person. It's God who changes hearts. Now, I'm not endorsing Nehemiah's methodology. But I can appreciate it because of his zeal for God. We can learn a lot of things from Nehemiah as we reflect upon the whole session. If you and I tolerate, we're on the reflection section. If we tolerate evil and wickedness, know this. You will go into spiritual apathy and lethargy. Your spiritual life will be almost non-existent. You will not grow. And if you're not growing, you're going backwards. And it brings dishonor to God. And when that happens, people no longer care about correct Bible doctrine. As a group, Christians are no longer unique. We become open to what some of the mainline denominations are doing. Everyone doing what is right in their own eyes. Drove by a church yesterday. I will not give you the name of the denomination, but it's one that does not follow Jesus. Their poster outside said, we are all about love. If there's no hell, you're not about love. You're giving people a false assurance that they can do whatever they want and God's going to take the end. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you stand no chance. This isn't me making this stuff up. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Narrow? Yep. Narrow is the path that leads to heaven. Broad and wide is the road that leads to destruction. There's a lot of people on that highway. I don't want to detour and act like I'm on that highway. Yeah, legally, I belong to Jesus. But does the world see that? If not, I'm in need of revival again. You see, when revival does take place, there's no guarantee for permanency either. You and I tend to do whatever it is our fleshly body wants to do sometimes. So what do we do? We have that constant dedication and commitment to work and to pursue God at all costs. You and I need to have a desire, a want to, to read the Bible, to study the Bible, to be in a continual attitude of prayer, being in fellowship with each other, being willing to be accountable with each other. I still remember a friend who came to me years ago. We've been married about eight years. He loved me so much he was able to get in my face and say, you're destroying your marriage. You're married to the church. Your wife will never leave you, but you're breaking your spirit. I did not like hearing that. In fact, I told him, I said, George, I don't think you really understand have a great marriage. And it took a little while later for me to finally see, yeah, it was a great marriage, but it wasn't because of me. I needed someone that was willing to pursue God, be willing to hold me accountable, even if it meant our friendship. Because it was more important to him to be obedient to God. And I praise God for that. Revival is costly. But the rewards are rich. Don't settle for anything other than revival. Let's stand as we close the prayer. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we are amazed that you continue to pursue us. 
that you don't just throw your hands up and give up and say, that's it, I'm done. But you want us to not be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, to become more like Jesus. Father, we thank you for your word and for your Holy Spirit who takes it and applies it to our hearts just as we need. Lord, in these different areas, we recognize that they are very specific to the nation of Israel, but the principles are applicable to us today. And I think in particular of the whole issue of intermarrying. Father, forgive us when we have not been clear with our young people that they need to be looking for godly men and women. Men and women who love Jesus, who are born again, who are part of the same family that they are. Help us to hold them accountable. And help them to have a teachable spirit. To be willing to wait upon you and not to run ahead of you. Not to do their own thing thinking it's all going to work out in the end that they know better. Father, none of us knows better. We just simply need to be obedient to your word. And Father, we thank you for the revival that you will bring in our lives individually and hopefully as a church, as a community, as a state, possibly as a nation. But it has to happen with me. Lord, if there's anyone here today that wants that revival in their own lives, and they see areas in their lives that need to be adjusted and changed, give them the courage to come forward later on and to visit with me and others about it, that we might walk together becoming more like Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.